created this pandemic threat are the real danger facing America today. So let's look exactly, what exactly is the so-called bird flu? Let's look at it scientifically for just a minute. The bird flu is simply a slang term, folks, given to a specific strain of influenza virus. Specifically in biochemical terms, biological terms, is called H5N1 because of its RNA and DNA structure. The H5N1 virus, folks, is indeed unique to birds. Virologists have long determined, and now this is going back to the 1910s, 1920s, that H5N1 is indeed unique only to birds and is found naturally in most wild bird populations. Typically, it's not a problem with birds. It has zero mortality to the bird population and is absolutely, let me emphasize this, absolutely is not typically passed on to human hosts. Folks, it's only when the bird populations become overstressed due to either massive contamination of their environment or the overpopulation of a bird, bird flock does the cellular terrain of the bird flock change. The internal workings of the birds as a whole change. When the birds become stressed, their internal terrain changes, then this H5N1 virus can in fact become dangerous or even lethal to the bird population. When the bird dies, folks, this virus in fact evolves into a fungal parasite. Let me emphasize, a virus is the seed, the spore of a fungus. That's what a virus is, as opposed to a bacteria, which is a living one-celled organism. Okay? A virus is the, is the microscopic seed or spores of specific funguses. So when the virus uh, evolves and uh, begins to affect a whole bird population, it helps Mother Nature to cull the flock to bring it back into the balance that is necessary to keep the bird itself, the bird genes itself intact. The fungal parasite that evolves from the influenza, H5N1, really helps to rapidly decompose the bird as well. It's part of nature's plan. The virus and the fungus uh, has been with the bird population since the day they first began to swim and fly. It's part of the system, part of the ecosystem of nature. Should not be feared, should not be something that we should fear as a, as a country, as a nation. So, why all this hype then? What I just said is true and I absolutely guarantee you that it is true. Why is there such hype over the bird flu? Now, there is a possibility, there is a way that the H5N1 bird influenza virus can infect humans, become, can become deadly to humans as well. And that is simply when the bird flu H5N1 mutates because of specific environmental toxic loads. Heavy toxins such as PCPs, such as other type of, of uh, neurotic type of gases, those type of toxic chemicals can cause a mutation which can jump in from the bird to the human population. Now these mutations, I've got to emphasize, just never do occur naturally. It's only when we see human introduced toxins where humans have, have messed with mother nature basically that we see these mutations happen. Always keep in mind when you think about the bird flu folks that the so-called H5N1 virus is simply one of over 1,500 naturally benign viruses which are part of nature's life cycle. Did you know there was 1,500, over 1,500 different viruses that are benign to humans, absolutely benign? From another example perhaps is the parvovirus of a dog. 
a puppy gets it as deadly to a puppy. Humans have no effect on this virus whatsoever. Just like the, the, the parvo, parvo virus, H5N1, has indeed been a part of planet Earth for many, many thousands of years without, without causing massive human deaths or human what's called pandemics. All right? But wait a minute, didn't we have a pandemic in, in our history back in 1918? Well, yes we have had, and let me explain that to help you understand that. Because I promise you that you won't hear a, a talk show host talking about H5N1 bird flu without bringing home the fact that millions of Americans died from the 1918 pandemic. Folks, Americans, human beings, uh, and others all over the world have many different uh, strains of influenza viruses that affect humans negatively. But let me just tell you that. Just like the bird flu in birds, the only time influenza virus becomes deadly to humans is when the human body is toxic as well. When the human cellular terrain is out of balance. So we really shouldn't fear uh, a seasonal influenza virus at all. But Americans have been programmed in our minds, oh golly, we need to get an influenza shot every single single winter. The flu season is coming. Line up. Go to your local Mormon church stake center or wherever and get your flu vaccine. Get it done. Once again, only when outside pathogens are introduced uh, to the human, human uh, terrain do these viral organisms mutate into super deadly toxins. Folks, this is the truth you need to know. You've got to know this about the 1918 pandemic. Let's look and see exactly what happened back then. Between the, the, the decade of 1900 to 1912, researchers granted and funded by John D. Rockefeller mainly, primarily, began mass vaccination campaigns again in America. But you know, Americans didn't really buy into that. They didn't want to, to have this vaccine. They thought, well, we, we don't need this. Why should we have it? Primarily aimed at smallpox, uh, vaccination injections eventually evolved into influenza injections as well. So while these vaccines were being produced, not many Americans wanted to voluntarily have a needle poked into their arm with some kind of germs being put into them. Well, here's where the first forced or mandatory vaccinations began to plague America. This happened uh, two years after the research was basically completed. In 1914, the so-called Great War begins in Europe, which the Great War we know today is World War I. The, the United States didn't really officially enter World War I until the year 1917. Uh, President Wilson eventually declared war on Germany following the pressure put on to him and Congress by the sinking of the Lusitania, the, the equivalent at that time of the Titanic, a massive, wonderfully built and equipped luxury cruise liner. Uh, this was sunk uh, by uh, German uh, U-boats and uh, great outrage uh, occurred in the United States and Britain over that sinking. When the U.S. finally entered the war on the side of the Great Britain and France uh, in early 1917, the nation of Spain uh, allowed the United States military to establish training bases on Spanish soil. This is important to understand when you, under, when you realize that the 1918 virus pandemic was called the Spanish flu. This is the key to understanding where it got its name from, where it originated from in Spain. It originated specifically from the Spanish bases, U.S. military bases in Spain. 
As part of the mobilization for the war effort, in the spring and summer of 1917, America goes into full production of war material. Bullets, tanks, machine guns, all these new little uh, uh, me me mechanized warfare uh, inventions were produced. For the first time, American men are drafted, forced basically, into military service and then deployed for training in bases in Spain. This is very important to understand. For the very first time in U.S. history, all new recruits, Army, Navy, Marines, Air Force, all new recruits are given mandatory vaccinations one of which is a very broad... But they had the ones they brought from the jungle, though. Yeah, they had those, but there were relatively few. What, what you do is you have a gang housing, you're going to have an epidemic transmission of infection in a confined space. Oh, is that the problem? So, anyway, the Greens came in. Now we had these, and then we're, we're taking our sage stocks to clean them up, and God, now I'm discovering new viruses. So... I said, shoot, us, priest. Well, I got an invitation from the Sister Kinney Foundation, you know, which was the opposing foundation, and that was the live virus. Oh, right. Yeah, they had jumped on Sabin's bandwagon. Mm -hmm. And they had asked me to come down and give a talk at, at the Sister Kinney Foundation meeting. And I said, it was an international meeting. I thought, God, what am I going to talk about? I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to talk about the detection of non-detectable viruses as a topic. There were those who didn't want a live virus vaccine. They concentrated. The National Foundation for Infantile Paralysis concentrated all its efforts on getting more and more people to use the killed virus vaccine while they were supporting me for research on the live virus vaccine. So now i got to have something, you know, that's going to attract attention. <laughs> so I thought, gee, that damn SB40, I mean, that, that damn that vacuolating agent that we have, I'm going to just pick that particular one. Mm -hmm. That virus has got to be in, in vaccines, and uh, it's got to be in Sabin's vaccine, so I quickly tested it. <laughs> sure enough, it was in there. And I'll be damned. So now, uh, so I go ahead and... Uh, so you just took stocks of Sabin's vaccine off the shelf here at Merck? Yeah, well, that had not been made at Merck. It was made at Merck. And you were making it for Sabin at this point. Yeah, it was made before I came. Yeah, but at this point, Sabin is still just doing these massive field trials. Mm -hmm. Okay. In Russia and so forth. So I go down, I talked about the... Um, the detection of non-detected virus. And I told Albert... Uh, but at this point, Sabin is still just doing these massive field trials. Mm -hmm. Okay. In Russia and so forth. So I go down, I talked about the, um, the detection of non-detected virus. And I told Albert, I said, listen, Albert, I said, you know, you and I are good friends. But I said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go down there and you're going to get upset. But I'm going to talk about a virus that's in your vaccine. Now, you're going to get rid of the virus. Don't worry about it. You're going to get rid mm -hmm. of it. But, um, um, so of course, Albert was very upset with me. And what said, did he say? Well, he said basically that this, this is just another obfuscation that is going to upset vaccines. And I said, well, you know, you're absolutely right. But I said, we have a new era here. We have a new era of a detection. And the important thing is to get rid of these viruses. Why would he call it an obfuscation if it was a virus that was contaminating well, no, vaccines? Because, we, well, there are 40 different viruses in these vaccines anyway that we were inactivating. And, uh, but you weren't inactivating the that, his, though. That's correct. No, that's right. But she, yellow fever vaccine had leukemia yeah. virus in it. And, you know, this is in the days of very crude science. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I went down and talked to him, and I would say, well, why are you concerned about it? I said, well, I'll tell you what. I said, I have a feeling in my bones that this virus is different. I, I don't know why to tell you this, but I've been around biology a long time. I just think this virus may have some long-term effects. Mm -hmm. And he said, what? I said, oh, cancer. <laughs> yeah. I love it. And I love it. Said, Go ahead. Yeah. No. I said, Albert, I said, you, you probably think I'm nuts, but I just have that feeling. Well, in the meantime, we had taken this virus and put it into monkey, into hamsters. Uh-huh. So, 
we had this meeting and that was sort of the topic of the day and the jokes that were going around was, gee, we would win the Olympics because uh, the Russians would all be loaded down with tumors. <laughs> this is where the vaccine was being tested. This was, this was yeah, right. Anderson. Right. So, uh, and it really destroyed the meeting. You know, it was a big image. Yeah, right. So it was sort of the topic. No. Anyway, um, was this the Cancer Society meeting in New York? Uh, no, no, this Society? was the uh, Sister Kenny. Oh, it was Sister Kenny, right? And uh, Del Beco got up and said uh, that he foresaw problems with these kinds of agents. Why didn't this get out in the press? Well, I guess it did. I don't remember. We had no press release on it. Obviously, you don't go out. This is a scientific affair within the scientific mm -hmm. community. This is a scientific affair within the scientific mm -hmm. community. An historic victory over a dread disease is dramatically unfolded at the University of Michigan. Here, scientists usher in a new medical age with the monumental reports that prove the salt vaccine against crippling polio to be a sensational success. It's a day of triumph for 40-year-old Dr. Jonas E. Salk, developer of the vaccine. He arrives with Basil O'Connor, head of the National Foundation for Infantile Paralysis, which financed the tests. Hundreds of reporters and scientists from all over the nation gather for the momentous announcement. It was too much of a show, there was too much Hollywood, there was too much exaggeration, and the impression in 1957 that was, uh, no, in 1954, uh, that was given was that the problem had been solved, that polio had been conquered. But anyway, and we knew it was in our seed stock for making the vaccine. Mm -hmm. That virus, you see, it's one in 10,000 particles is not inactivated by formaldehyde. It was good science at the time because that was what you did. You didn't worry about these wild viruses. So you discovered it wasn't being inactivated in the salt vaccine. Correct. Either. So then, uh, the next thing you know is three, four weeks after that, and I found that there were tumors popping out in these hamsters. Despite AIDS and leukemia suddenly becoming pandemic from wild viruses, Hillman said this was good science at that time. So why don't you go out, run out, and get another vaccine from these people? Find out where AIDS started off, okay? Jeez, the Belgian Congo. Geez, where did it start off in America anyway? Follow this vaccine trail and it's not pretty. You may find that the same pharmaceutical companies, IG Farben, Bayer Pharmaceuticals, Baxter, Novartis, all these guys are what? Tied together doing what kind of research? The recombination of RNA? Oh my gosh. How did we get a swine, a bird, and a human flu all put together? Are you telling me some cow caught a chicken in the midair while the chicken was trying to get away, had intercourse with the chicken, okay, and then kissed a man? I mean, come on. You people buy this stuff? How about race-specific bioweapons? Don't believe me. Read the project for a new American century, where Dick Cheney and Wolfowitz, you remember those guys' names, wrote in the document that they should create and utilize race-specific bioweapons. You think I'm kidding. This is also in that document, that Project for a New American Century, okay? Rebuilding America's Defenses. I just gave you the title. There's your homework, folks, where they said we need a new Pearl Harbor-like event to get what we want accomplished. Well, was 9-11 a Pearl Harbor event for you? Just a thought for the day, because maybe the global elitist bankers, eugenicists, maybe they keep score by how many of your family members they actually kill. How do they keep score? Hmm. So anyway, can't let you go without this. Remember, mercury's good for you. Here's a little clip telling you how good mercury is. Mercury-containing vaccines may help not harm kids, according to two new studies in the journal Pediatrics. There have been widespread concerns that mercury-based preservatives in vaccines might impair the neurological development of children. These new studies suggest that the opposite, that the preservatives may actually be associated with improved behavior and mental performance. 
So are any of you people toxicologists? You want to come on my show and tell me how mercury is good for you? The new thing is, well, there's less mercury in, a, in, the, in the flu shot than there is in a um, tuna fish sandwich. Ingesting mercury and injecting mercury in directly into your blood, mainlining it, is two different things. Putting it in your body past your immune system, most of the mercury you eat or whatever you pass, the mercury you get injected doesn't. What's really important about this whole thing is how they're selling you. When we play that CFR clip, this is the Council on Foreign Relations telling you, well, this is what we'll use. Why is the Council on Foreign Relations caring if you get a vaccine shot or not? Are they making money on this? Are they making money killing you? Do bankers make money on wars? Do gun makers make money on wars? Couldn't be, huh? It's just a coincidence. We've all been trying to solve this puzzle for a while now. What do chemtrails, the swine flu vaccine, the swine flu itself, and the depopulation plans in the New World Order all really have to do with each other? Nobody's really put together this puzzle with a coherent theory. We haven't had a unified, coherent theory that just explains the reasoning behind all of this until recently. And I'm not going to take credit for this theory. I'm just passing along information that got passed to me. So hopefully you'll listen to this with an open mind. I'll start this off by giving a little background on what a cytokine storm is. Now, a cytokine storm is the basic killing element of any highly deadly virus that kills quickly, whether it's the 1918 pandemic, which was a version of swine flu, SARS, or H5N1 bird flu. These all kill using a cytokine storm. Now, cytokine storms have some unique characteristics, and I'll get into that in a minute. But what a cytokine is, from my understanding, now I'm not a doctor, but from my understanding, it's a little like cell inside your body, and what it does is activate all your immune cells. So it starts activating T cells, and if a cytokine's going nuts, as a result, the T cells are going to start going nuts and attacking everything. So your immune system basically starts attacking your own body, and that's what causes massive hemorrhaging and very fast deaths. In the 1918 pandemic, it's been reported that people felt fine in the morning and by the afternoon they were dead with blood coming out of their eyeballs and all that. So, a cytokine storm is not a good thing. And another unique characteristic of a cytokine storm is that it affects mostly people with healthy immune systems. And the reason behind this is that, as the Wikipedia article here states, a cytokine storm is a potentially fatal immune reaction consisting of a positive feedback loop. Now, note the word feedback. Think of this like feedback into a microphone. It starts off soft, but it just starts building on itself until it, it'll bust your eardrums, you know? So, if you have the volume turned down, like an old person with a weak immune system, this feedback loop isn't going to take place. But if you're a strong person with a strong immune system, the stronger your immune system is, the stronger it's going to hurt itself. The, you know, the more power it has, the quicker that feedback loop is going to start. And at that point, you're really screwed. This brings me to the article in question. A YouTube viewer was kind enough to forward me to this page. And at first, I thought this guy might be a little wonky. And he very well may be. But a lot of his analysis is just dead on. This is KenWelsh.com with a dash in it. Apparently he's from Houston. I don't know much about him. Although he claims to have been researching this phenomenon for the last 10 years with chemtrails, the pandemics. He's, he's been watching this since around 2000. So he has a, he has a lot of knowledge on this. Now I'm going to cut to his analysis on how this puzzle fits together with the swine flu vaccines the swine flu itself, the chemtrails that have been sprayed for the last 10 years, and the depopulation agenda of the New World Order. So I'm just going to read verbatim for a minute. The puzzle they cannot solve is why the Western governments are so adamant about getting people to actually take the shots. Most of us understand that these big vaccine campaigns are simply money-making programs for big pharma, third in the pantheon of corporate players that own and operate virtually all Western governments. But does it make sense this time? After all, these vaccines are already paid for. They could be dumped in a landfill and the manufacturers wouldn't care at all. Here's the important part. He says, the secret purpose of the swine flu vaccine is not obvious until you fully understand what the vaccine does. And you must combine that information with the understanding that the real pandemic is just around the corner. 
Now, I'm sure we could all agree that the novel form of H1N1 is not a huge killer. I mean, it, it can cause cyclotene storms in a very small percentage of people, and it can be deadly, but as a whole, it's actually less deadly than a normal flu strain. So, he says he just came across this information a couple of days ago when he was sent um, part of the Blaylock Wellness Report by Dr. Russell Blaylock. Now, here's what Russell Blaylock, a medical doctor, has to say about the situation. No one should take the swine flu vaccine. It is one of the most dangerous vaccines ever devised. It contains an immune adjuvant called squalene MF59, which is shown to cause severe autoimmune disorders, such as MS, rheumatoid arthritis, and lupus. This vaccine adjuvant that is strongly linked to Gulf War Syndrome, which has killed over 10,000 soldiers and caused a 200% increase in the fatal Lou Gehrig's disease. This swine flu virus kills by causing a cytokine storm which means that it causes the body's immune system to overreact and that is why it's killing young people and it is a mild disease in the elderly. The elderly have weakened immune systems. This vaccine is a very powerful immune stimulator and carries the real possibility of making lethality of the virus that much greater. What Dr. Blaylock is saying is that the squalene MF59 adjuvant is actually a really powerful immune system booster. It stimulates it. And normally this would be a good thing, but if a cytokine storm starts to occur, a boosted immune system is really bad because it's just going to attack itself that much harder. So he believes even with the novel form of H1N1, which isn't very deadly, he believes that the H1N1 vaccines will actually cause an increased risk in cytokine storms. And Welsh also has his analysis on it. He says, what Dr. Blaylock is saying is that the vaccine will greatly boost the cytokine storm effect, increasing the chance that people will die from the silly swine flu virus before the vaccine can kill it off. He doesn't realize that the disease with 20 times the cytokine effect is just around the corner. At the beginning of this article, Welsh claimed that he only started to research this phenomena because in 1998, chemtrails started and it was initially linked to a banned pesticide called ethylene dibromide. Now, he continues, Populations of all Western nations practicing socialized welfare systems, like the U.S., have already had their ability to shut down the cytokine storm greatly impaired by six to ten years of chemtrail spraying. Now the part of your immune system that produces the cytokine storm is put in hyperdrive by the swine flu shot. Then when the real killer virus comes along in December or January, your chances of survival are going to be poor. So this is his theory. They've been spraying the chemtrails for the last 10 years to reduce your body's ability to fight the cytokine storm effect. Then they boost the cytokine storm effect by putting the adjuvants in the H1N1 vaccine. Then the real killer comes along, real killer virus that produces a lot of the cytokine storm effect, and the puzzle's complete depopulation. Now, Welsh finished his analysis with this, and I couldn't say it any better. No wonder Homeland Security has spent thousands of man hours trying to locate sites for mass burials. Those folks are not stupid, they know what is coming. You, on the other hand, are assumed to be both stupid and powerless. And I advise everybody to look at the videos of the millions of cheap disposable coffins that have been made by FEMA in the last few years.